Welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar, taking inventory optimization to the next level. Before I introduce myself briefly, I would, look, would like to mention that the webinar will be recorded and uploaded on our DeGreuter YouTube channel. My name is Stefan Giesen and I manage the business and economics program at DeGreuter. I would like to provide a bit of background information about the Gorta. The Gorta is an international publishing house based in Berlin. We have been publishing scientific and academic works for 270 years. On average, we publish over 1,300 new book titles and more than 900 journals from a wide range of subject areas every year. We also publish uh, digital media, and we are one of the leading open access publishers in the world. The idea of this webinar is originated from Nicholas Vendeput's new book, Inventory Optimization, Models and Simulations, which will be published by the Grotter at the end of August this year. That is from my side. I would like uh, to give the floor to our host of the webinar, Eric Wilson. Eric is uh, the director of SOAT leadership for the Institute of Business Forecasting, IBF, and recipient of the Excellence in Business and Forecasting Planning Award. Eric, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, <laughs> Stefan. I I'm excited to be part of this uh, forum. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, for putting this on, and thank you, uh, Stefan, as well, for, for making this available for everybody as well. So this is going to be an exciting, I, I'm not the star, the panel is, and inventory is the star today. That's what we're going to be talking about. So with that, I'm going to get right into uh, letting the panel introduce themselves. And with that, there is one other person on the panel as well. That's you, the practitioners. Uh, the academics out there that want to ask questions to the panel. So that is a very, very important part of this as well. So please, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Click that, ask your questions in there. I'm going to be looking through these questions and filtering these questions to the panel and allow them to answer your questions. That's what this is about, is answering your questions and allowing these experts to give their insights into what you wanna know. So anytime during it, you can start loading up the questions, Q&A right now. Uh, prefer that over the chat. It's easier to moderate out of the Q&A, so please put your questions in the Q&A box. With that, I'm gonna go right to uh, allowing the panel to introduce themselves. I'll start from left to right on my screen, which is uh, Cohen. If you want to give a minute, introduce yourself, uh, and yeah. we'll go through, and then I'll start with the questions. Yep. Okay. I gladly introduce myself. So my name is Kun Kobart. Um, Twenty years, twenty-eight years active in supply chain management. Two years in academics. Six years in the industry, working for AT and T and PepsiCo, and then moved to consulting since twenty years. Uh, since nine years with PwC, where I'm leading within PwC Belgium, uh, the supply chain planning competency group. Okay. Stefan, a uh, fellow US from Georgia. Hi, I'm uh, Stefan Koch. I am um, a mathematician by education and have lived in supply chain my whole career. Um, 23 years, I think now. And uh, my, uh, my whole thing is trying to combine those two and innovate the space. Uh, my current uh, big thing is probabilistic planning and forecasting and uh, inventory optimization is, uh, is one of my, uh, my darlings in that space. Okay. We're going to get into some uh, distribution questions here real soon that I'm sure you're going to have some insights on. So. I might. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Carl Eric next. Hello, uh, I'm Carl Eric Deveau. I started supply planning in 2004. I've worked in um, hygiene products, which is a Bosch way of saying toilet paper, uh, turbochargers, ice cream, soup, pies, jewelry, iron fashions. And every time, while the unique challenge in each, in each industry, the key to inventory optimization is 
having good software used by good people who understand what's happening following a formal process. And uh, before we pass on, I'm a bit uh, passionate about using some static models and I'm always trying to read stuff and, and uh, to optimize inventory. And, and sometimes I get a bit too excited at talking about it. So if I get ahead of myself, please stop me and uh, I'll calm down. Okay. And uh, saving uh, the best for last. And congratulations, Nicholas, on your upcoming book. Uh, it led to the last one. It was fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to uh, reading this one on inventory as well. So, Nicholas Van Poop. Thank you, Mike. Such a pleasure to be uh, here with all uh, the panelists today. So, um, let me introduce myself in a minute. Uh, so, Nicolas Van Poop, I am working as a supply chain data scientist specialize on one hand on all the inventory optimization uh, programs and on the other one on the forecasting. I, spending, uh, I spend most of my time either writing books, uh, doing consultancy projects, or uh, teaching at university. Okay. Well, I forgot one more person on the panel. You didn't show up on my top there, but from Holiday. Uh, glad you can join us, Brom. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, Brom Lesmet. I, I did a PhD in multi-echelon inventory optimization in the far past, and um, yeah, that uh, that's part of my supply chain experience, so to speak. Currently, uh, CEO of Solventure, and uh, for part of my time teaching at the Direct Business School in the supply chain and operations, and also very happy to be here to support Nicolas in this great adventure. I'm glad you can join us as well. So. Let's jump right into the questions. We already have them coming in, so please, if you have your questions, you can you know ask them in the in the Q and A section below. This being kind of practitioners and academics out there in this audience, I think we got a great mixture of people in the audience today, and it's kind of you know that balance between academia and you know what the practitioners actually do. I want to start off with actually that question. When it comes to inventory optimization, is there and what are the real discrepancies or differences between what, a, what we see in academia and what we may be seeing in real life or what people are, are actually doing? So is there, is there a discrepancy? Or what are the similarities? And, and let's start with that. So anybody want to kick that one off? I'm happy to kick that one off uh, if that's okay for you, Eric. Please. Um, I had the honor uh, about uh, six months ago, something like that, uh, to attend an academic seminar on uh, all kind of inventory optimization uh, techniques. And uh, I was in academia myself. It's a very long time ago, more than 25 years ago. Um, but I was kind of baffled by the complexity of the models that were being presented there, uh, putting that in contrast with what I see uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in, in, in practice. There is a tremendous discrepancy between uh, the stylized models which are being developed uh, in academia and very often the rules of thumb which are still being applied in, in, in practice. Uh, of course, now I present it very black and white, but, but nevertheless, I, I, I experience that as a very big uh, gap. Obviously, uh, there are companies which are more advanced and which are applying more advanced uh, techniques, very often embedded in software solutions that they, uh, that they have in place. Um, but of course, we see that also a, a bit as a role as, as, as consultants to kind of bridge that gap and to see uh, what potential benefits can we get from these uh, complex algorithms? Where do they add value? And in what way can we then effectively apply them in a business environment? But nevertheless, it remains a challenge to convince users in, 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 in business practice to use these more complicated algorithms. In first place, we need to prove the added value of what they can bring. Okay. And if I, if I may add, I, I fully agree with that, uh, Kuhn. But um, uh, I think the models that are being developed in, um, in universities, and I've been to these presentations, and uh, I was amazed as well by the sheer number of uh, academics working on this compared to what we actually see trickle down into business. 
and uh, the complexity, but also the complexity of testing if the models were accurate. And I, I saw that there were major obstacles to scaling this out uh, beyond sets that are more than a couple of hundred uh, samples. Um, and I think that's a, a major gap that needs to be addressed by the academics before the, the consultants can even take it to the, to the businesses, is have, make them focus more on uh, applicability to very large data sets. You see that a lot in the data science. You don't see that a lot on the uh, the more statistical side of the equation in academics. I think. Okay. This is this is this is really a, a great topic and conversation, and I totally agree with, with Stefan and Kuhn. I, I'm sure that that uh, Pierre-Éric and Van will, will agree as well. What we see in the academic world is that people come with more and more and more advanced models that reply to very specific question and specific need, and at the same time. I guess supply chain and uh, practitioners and companies work today with the same kind of models as 20 years ago and still ask themselves the same question. What is safety stuff? Can I use the formula I just saw on Wikipedia? Do I understand properly the formula that's on Wikipedia? I still find that. So somehow it's like a kidney is, is making progress every year, even so I'm not always entirely sure it goes in the perfect direction, but at the same time, professionals that just stay on the safety stock formula that's on, uh, on Wikipedia. So for sure there we see a discrepancy. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot about complexity. So with that, what exactly is that balance or is there a balance between simplicity of a model that people can understand and actually use uh, and then the complexity of a model that may be a little more, more precise but has problems scaling and other issues with it as well? What's that balance, perfect balance then? That's a, it's a difficult uh, question. Um, in a sense that that balance will be different depending on the user, I think. Uh, what, I, what I experience is that when we come with advanced models and we present them to users in a company, to planners or uh, uh, people that have to determine what are the optimal stock levels, uh, these people will only apply these techniques as long as they understand what is happening in these formulas. Uh, and as soon as you reach a limit where they do not do no longer fully understand what do these formulas now exactly do, at that moment they lose confidence in the in the formula. So it depends very much on on the the, the level of education of the people that you have in front of you. And it is a reality that if we look at uh, the level of planners, it is very different depending from company to company. In some companies, you have uh, planners which have a master degree and where you can go further than in other companies where the level of education of the planners is somewhat lower. Uh, and I think that's a very important element uh, in the equation. Okay. Makes me, me think of uh, multi echelon Ekun, that uh, I did my PhD. I finished it in 2009, so that's more than 10 years ago. And I haven't seen a lot of companies really implemented in practice. And um, though there's a lot of models uh, available and one of the biggest hurdles to get over is getting people to understand why multi echelon is shifting more of the stocks downstream. It's something that they intuitively uh, don't understand. Eh? On the contrary, they've always been taught that you need to centralize stocks and that is better. So if you come with a model which will push out inventory, it's really hard for people to to get over that and um, despite all the analytics uh, getting the people to understand what the models are doing and why they are proposing something is really key in driving adoption so look real quick Braun, with that i mean carlos just had a question is for how do you best combat you know in the business environment getting executives or people to understand multi-echelon or some more complex inventory optimization type strategies that's not maybe, you know, second nature to them. Yeah, I, I believe piloting it, that's at least what I did in the past is that, and it starts with simple things. If, if people have been using a safety stock of 10 days, like a flat rate for everything, and then you come up with a simple safety stock calculation and all of a sudden for some items you only need three days and for others you would need 30 days. 
you 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 need to pilot and and uh, you need to say okay we can lower for that fast mover from 10 days to three days and people will tell you you are nuts right that's crazy it will never work with three days so what what you do is you put seven days in block stocked so if something happens you can unblock it and you immediately have the product to be available so you need to pilot in a risk-free way and if you then do it in that way and they see after three months that it really works with three days, that's when people will even get enthusiast and all of a sudden realize, hey, well, if this works for the pilot, then I want to scale it up. But it's, it's a really gentle change process. In my experience, you need to go through if you want people to believe in the output of uh, all the algorithms. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the education part, using as many visuals as possible, is the key. And it's often uh, so it's, the people who take the decisions on inventory optimization, either software or new programs, are often not that educated on what the right inventory is or, or you should do it. And they do things. So, yeah, my A products, I need th three weeks. My B products, uh, th six weeks. And that's the, the exactly like Brown said, is the biggest hurdle to, uh, to, uh, to go over. The second element to your question is what's the biggest discrepancy is for me, maybe some of the, the, the very advanced um, models that are currently being worked on by academia do provide some uh, advantage to optimize the inventory that actually gets destroyed within as soon as you get to what's the minimum order quantity. Oh, yeah, it's a pallet, right? Thank you. It's a, and that's probably where the reality match uh, doesn't meet the, uh, the academia in that sense. Okay. I would, I would add, uh, with my experience being mostly with black box models, um, using proprietary software, commercial software, that there's also a, um, a problem with the users or the, the, the customers understanding that what the data means, right? And uh, if you take something like lead time, um, they take a lead time out of an ERP system and think that will work in their inventory model. And when you say no, um, you know, that's more like a negotiated lead time or a, a guaranteed lead time. And what the model needs are probably some average lead time and a variable portion. Those are two numbers and they're both different than the one you've got. Um, that is when you're implementing a, a solution as a consultant, you have a lot of time during that implementation to explain that and to educate. If you have um, people that are going to implement an academic model uh, by themselves, they have no one to really teach them that that lead time number that they're looking at is a different lead time than the one that they believe in their head. And they're gonna get garbage out if they're gonna put garbage in. Um, so I think that part is, is, is a critical piece. If, you're, if you want to adopt a simple model, that it needs to go hand in hand with the understanding of what that data actually is and what the data is that you've got in your ERP system and if you can or cannot use it. Okay, I, I would like there to add something on top of uh, what Kerleric and Vance uh, discussed. So coming back to the question, if people or the understandings they have of Model is the limiting factor, how do we be, how, how are we making sure that we can bring those people to use more advanced programs? Because as said Kuhn, the higher the understanding of the practitioner, of the people in supply chain, of the planner, the higher it is, the, the more complex you can create a model, right? So that means also more savings. Um, as, a, as a consultant, what I always like to do is to start any project by a training, explaining people if it's about forecasting, basic forecasting technique or basic inventory optimization techniques. And as Stefan just mentioned, and I think this is one of the best examples, lead time is confusing. The, the concept of lead time, no matter who you ask, what's the lead time for this product, you're always going to get different answers. So the first step for me is always training people. But for a long time, uh, multi echelon which is really the, I think, the most complex thing to do in inventory, was beyond my reach in the sense that I couldn't explain to supply chain practitioner how it would work and how you could optimize that. And, and while mentioning it, it's from time to time very counterintuitive. Now, as I was writing the book, I found out a way to explain a specific model, which is the, the, the guaranteed service time model, in a very easy way that you can show to people, even in Excel, how to optimize a supply chain with a few layers of warehouses for one product. And I think that if you take the time to do a simple example for one product in Excel, 
and you can explain to people so they can play with your Excel file and they see how it works. Once they get this, then you can go to a full scale model and they will understand how it works. And then as everyone said here, as soon as people understand, they accept the model and they also understand the limitation of course. Yeah, that, that's exactly the way we approach it when uh, we, we try to break down the, 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 the total inventory into the uh, demand driven inventory, the supply driven inventory, and then showing the different impact on the variables driving those. And um, we, we often do that using uh, what are called an ABC products, so like fake products that don't exist to start with. And then I start introducing their own products uh, into, the, into that model. And when they see, to your point, Nicola, the, the impact of, oh, right. And my favorite realization is often, oh, I want 100% delivery, right? If you want 100% delivery, this is the size of the warehouse you want. Oh, right. What's, what's 97 looking like? Which is still very good, 97. So, and that's, yeah, that, those models, those um, models in Excel, and I know people don't really like Excel so often, to help teach and make people understand what are the key drivers that they can use to monitor and optimize their inventory are critical. Okay. Now, I mean, Stefan and Nicholas, you both brought up a, a great point there and it comes to another question. Obviously, simple model is going to work for simple people, uh, but there's a problem with the model. It, simplified assumptions, is, I think, is what you're talking about. You, you, ta you mentioned lead time. And, and I think there's some problematic with some models with oversimplified assumptions, lead time, uh, supplier, you know, uh, you know, sourcing as far as quality, distribution, I think falls in that as well. So is there a problem with the, the, some of the assumptions that go into these simplified models as well? If I may answer that, always. Please. Yeah. There's always, I, I have yet to find a, a single instance where the assumptions going in were correct. And um, it's usually a journey to figure out. Um, one of the things I've always done is what I would refer to as a calibration phase and where you basically test the model that you're developing against a existing state. And you try and identify where uh, the data is dramatically different. Uh, than what you would have expected if you've put the existing approach into your new model. And that's when you find things such as lead times or other parameters, review periods, or you name it, whatever parameters go into uh, a multi actual inventory model when you find which ones could be the driver. Um, but yeah, it's always a problem. So it's not always just forecast error. There's a lot of other drivers there as sometimes, well. Sometimes, yeah, actually, sometimes it is, but usually it's not. You know, and and it's the other ones. It's those parameters that go on the inventory model that are much harder to discover, because uh, people are used to a lot of the numbers, and but they're being used in a different context, and they make sense in that context. That doesn't mean they make sense in the uh, MEIO context. And then and, and it has to go over a hurdle for people to realize that there's actually two different meanings to this one thing. I know, Brom, you, you've talked on this before as well. This is something. Yeah, well, actually, the, the, um, I always say that academics are good in either making very specific assumptions or, in, or either in simplifying the problem up to a point that it gets mathematically elegant. Yeah. And the, the good example is the is the multi echelon model from Graves, the original model which assumes constant lead times and the same review period for all the echelons or all the stages in the network. If you make enough of assumptions, you get to a mathematically elegant optimization problem. And um, I think that's what some academics have done, or either they make very specific assumptions which make that the applicability is very limited to, to, to real life. So that's certainly also one of the hurdles if you want to apply the science to real life is that you either need to generalize some of those assumptions, but then you almost need to adjust the models. That's basically what I did in my PhD. I, I had to work with stochastic lead times. I, I had to take into account batching. And if you looked at the literature, well, stochastic lead times and batching that was solved in a distribution not network, but not in a production or an assembly type of environment. So if, if you want to come to real life constraints, you either need to change existing models or you need to start combining existing models 
And um, I think that's also one of the practical hurdles to get the science uh, uh, applied into real life situations. But I think yeah. that is also the, the area where simulation can add a lot of uh, value. Uh, and Nicola emphasizes that also in his book, eh? uh, he, he promotes simulation uh, a lot. And I think simulation is the technique that allows you, if you have a stylized model and you apply it in a real life situation, simulation can help you a lot in, in, in assessing whether those assumptions still hold when you uh, apply real life data uh, on the model. And then you can tweak it uh, where necessary. Well, whether the assumptions are problematic, I think that's true, Kun. Uh, you, yeah. could, you could take a model which does not account for stochastic lead times. And in the simulation model, you could see what the stochastic lead times do with the results, right? Yeah. Is it still, can it still be used? Yes or no? I think that's very mm -hmm. fair. It's a good way to validate uh, the applicability of, of models. So, Nicholas? Yeah, definitely. I think that one of the main constraints that we see or that I see based on my experience with real supply chain and, and all the time I spent reviewing those academic models is uh, the fact that most of the, the models assume that the demand is normally distributed. If someone was just mentioning, mentioning it in the comments, everyone in the academic world, nearly everyone is assuming demand is normally distributed, demand is stationary. But if we have here supply chain practitioners listening to us, they will all be thinking, but my demand has some seasonality, it has some trends. Um, so it's not normally distributed, right? So then again, as, as Bram and Kuhn mentioned, if you face such kind of demand, you can still use models that assume a, a normal demand, even though you know it's not perfect, and you should maybe do some simulation to check, okay, even though I'm not using the perfect model that perfectly match my issue, I can still do a simulation to confirm that the output of the model will not be totally uh, out of scope. This is what I, I, I do a lot in the book, trying and testing each model against a simulation to show if it works or not. Okay. I'm going to get to some of the questions. We, uh, we got a lot of great questions coming in. I'll, I'll, I'll hit uh, Luis's question first. He had a couple questions. They I kind of tie them together because it looks at data or lack of data. Uh, and the importance of the data you have in being able to develop an inventory optimization. So with a new product, which is highly, uh, you know, variable, maybe sometimes longer lead times, or if you have it, uh, items that have bad data, let's say COVID-19 caused some problems in the data set that you're using right now. H how important or how are you going to be able to create inventory models with that type or no data or little data? So I, I would like to start with this question because I think and, uh, that this is one of the most interesting questions. As soon as you come from academic, where in the end you can just simulate normal data as much as you want to create a model and just prove that theoretically it does work. And when you move to real application in the supply chain world. Um, I think there, and we discussed that already in another webinar, uh, driving a real culture of a, a data-driven culture is really important in companies, especially in supply chain. People in supply chain need to understand that a clean master data, a clean uh, list of orders, demand, and so on, will enable them to produce a proper forecast and to produce a proper inventory optimization, right? Um, people mention, okay, should we use Excel, should we use a software provider, should we use uh, ETL, and so on. I like but that's of course totally personal and I'm quite looking forward to hear uh, the other panelist opinion on that. I like to use Python and I promote it a lot in the book saying that with this tool, you can at the same time clean data, review data and create your model at the same time. And I think that as soon as you give this tool to supply chain practitioner or to students at university, those people will get, I think it's really pleasure from manipulating and treating and cleaning the data. And this is how you create this um, data-driven supply chain or culture. Okay. Who else wants to tackle this one? On the, 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 the fact that the data is incomplete or sometimes wrong, I mean, who's not looked at some data and see oh, negative sales? I love negative sales. Uh, I don't, but it, they often happen. It's, um, I think, between the automated calculation process of what the optimized inventory is and 
before inputting that into the ERP or MRP or MPS system that actually drives the, the reordering, it's good to, to, to have a, a review of the data used to calculate that number between uh, a supply person and a commercial person to try to get to the next level of optimization. I'll take two examples. If one customer has gone on holiday and therefore is all the more the week before going on holiday, you create a spike in the week before and then a, a, a trough, which actually, if you assume that that's not going to happen again, you, you put too, more invent, too much inventory. Clearly, you're not going to do that to, on all your items, but if, if you can do that on your top 200 SKUs, and it's not a long process, most of the time, yes, this is fine, this is fine. You actually go to the next level of granularity. And because you've had that conversation with the other side of the business, aka either the supply side with the commercial side, the commercial side, you understand each other's problem and you work more together. It's often overlooked and from experience in, uh, with my customers, it's often probably the most powerful moment in the optimization of the whole supply chain. Okay. So Eric, what it triggers with me is that I think the challenges in implementing these models actually risk leading to a kind of a, a an opposite reaction. It, it might explain the success of something like demand-driven MRP. And demand-driven MRP basically is simplistic. Demand-driven MRP is going back to basic principles of pool which existed before the whole MRP uh, innovation. Yeah. So because we have difficulties in implementing and applying somewhat more advanced stuff, we go back all the way. So, so we skip 50 or 60 years of history. We, we go back to the, to, to the early ages to bring something to people that everybody understands. And when I, when I first saw the hype on DDMRP and I started investigating, I almost couldn't believe my eyes. So the, the, fact, that, the fact that it is such a big, a big success, I think really explains or illustrates that we have difficulties of bringing more advanced models uh, yeah, to, to, to the non-academic uh, planner. And um, it's a huge pity because these many of these techniques are proven yeah? so they are really valuable and the fact that we are not able and there's a whole movement which kind of rejects anything which is a bit more advanced that's it's very fascinating let's keep it on fascinating <laughs> so Bram, that actually goes to the core of i i think this topic of, of today is the the gap between academics and and practice Mm -hmm. um, and DDMRP is showing that gap. It's highlighting that gap in that if it's too complex, it will not get, get adopted. Or if it does get adopted, it gets adopted poorly. And uh, DDMRP with very simple methodology that almost anyone can understand is getting a huge adoption and is, you no, know, it, it, they're making huge benefits uh, at a lot of companies. And I think that also speaks to how poor those companies were before. Um, and, and, you know, this is, I think, the, the key thing to overcome is how can we make these approaches that are more sophisticated, how can we make them more accessible? And that's, I, I think that's the key question that, uh, that we need to answer. And, and, and for me, that's the key challenge I would like to... Um give to the um, academic world in a way. It's a, yes, please carry on going to the edge of how can we optimize, um, but at the same time, teach your uh, students to those techniques as well. So when we uh, do work with people in companies that understand what average means, the standard deviation and, and the likes are, but also make those complicated model as simple as possible. But I, it's, because, um, and it takes probably 20 to 30 years for a very advanced model to, to come into uh, uh, most companies. But that's probably is the challenge. It's uh, what academics works on today is going to impact us in 20 years when, when I retire. Okay. Anybody else want to hit this topic? Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, Eric, if I just may add something here, I, I think in this conversation, it's very so interesting 
But I totally see this issue yeah. as well from the, the project I've led and discussion I had online. We have at the same time some very advanced model on inventory optimization that can drive so much saving for companies. And we have a few companies that basically are able to do that and are doing those kind of projects, achieving all those savings. And at the same time, you have the big bulk of companies that do not understand inventory at all, and they all went back to the DMFP that simplifies everything. And I, I think this goes back to one of the first questions we asked ourselves. How do we train people in supply chain? How, as people in the academy, can we bring expertise, trainings, and value to the people in companies so that those people can use more advanced models? I think it's really a, a question of how do we train people? How do we explain stuff to people? Okay. Get to the next question. Uh, so there's a lot of things that's changing in the last, you know, 50 years that we talked about. One of them is the Amazon effect or omni-channel right now. And we have to start planning inventory maybe a little bit differently. Besides just multi-echelon, we have multi-channels now with the same pool of inventory. Is that impacting your inventory models? How are you accounting for, you know, these new sales channels inside your inventory optimization that you're currently doing? Is it separating, you know, pools of inventory? Is it finding ways to allocate outside of current inventory pools? What's the best methodology or different types of methodologies being used right now? Go ahead, Brom. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I let, let me say by, start by saying that first of all, I see that companies struggle a lot in the sense that uh, the omni-channel basically is splitting the inventory into two SKUs. I think that's the approach that I see uh, the companies I uh, talk to, um, that's what they choose. And okay, everybody knows that if you, if you split your inventory in two pools, you basically increase the inventory requirement. And um, the, the, the more clever thing to do, I believe is, to, to consider it physically as one pool and have it in one DC, but then logically starts splitting that up. And um, uh, early on in my career as a supply chain consultant, I, I, I studied that and, and uh, I didn't find a lot of literature uh, on it because if you virtually split up the inventory in two pools, um, okay, it's easy in the sense what it once it's split up, you can allocate from one part, let us say for the online and and for the other part, you can allocate to to the to the um, to the bricks uh, part. But there's two problems. One problem is if new supply is coming in, how, how do I build a kind of a fair share model which allocates across the two? That's one and two. Uh, even if you have virtually split it up, you will always see that it's it's not balanced. So you will not have enough in one pool and too much in another. So how do I rebalance? If, if it's physically in separate warehouses, it become very hard. But even if it would physically be in one warehouse and you would only have a logical split, how do I split that up? Or how do I rebalance those two uh, logical uh, in inventories or the, the inventory split? Um, I think there's, uh, I think there's even an academic challenge there to 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 study that and to come up with uh, models. And in general, I'm not a retail specialist, so if there's other people who have uh, different experiences, certainly open to that. Yeah. So, Sorry, Eric. Um, you oh, go ahead, Stefan. Yeah. So uh, I found the same thing in practice, but there's also usually a difference in the handling for the, mm -hmm. the e-commerce channel and say the brick and mortar or the e-commerce channel is usually a single units and the brick and mortar gets whole cases or whole pallets mm -hmm. and the whole handling of that material is different because of it. Um, so what, what I've seen happen is where the e-com that does in, in that scenario where they're handling the single units um, actually just has a zero lead time uh, consumption. It has its own inventory, which is in units, which has a single or zero lead time uh, supply from the uh, brick and mortar inventory that's sitting right next to it in the warehouse. 
um, which is uh, which has units and cases or whatever that may be. And simply because of that, that all you have is a, a broken into case that could potentially be all you have on inventory, but due to a zero lead time, you have no variability there and all your uh, demand variability just gets passed onto the brick and mortar inventory that has to cover for both. This is one solution I, I've seen, but uh, I'm sure there's others. Yeah. There's another effect that I've seen, uh, which is which is related to that. Uh, you refer to Amazon specifically. Um, I did a project recently for a uh, major CPG uh, manufacturer in the US. Uh, and what they experienced is that um, Amazon is getting so dominant uh, in the market that they can uh, impose a lot of variability upon their uh, suppliers. And what they see is that uh, as a CPG manufacturer, they are faced with tremendous variation in demand. Uh, all of a sudden, tremendous spikes that uh, pop up, which are followed then by long troughs and it's it's very hard to predict what we see is that some of these companies even have started building machine learning models simply to predict when will these spikes from amazon when will we be faced uh, with them so that creates again a totally different and new dynamic uh, for them so so kuhn have you seen if that those unexpected spikes and troughs are they caused by real demand patterns or are they caused by promotional activity? It's, uh, it's, it's indeed very much caused by promotions. Uh, but there are also some mechanics uh, which are at, at, at play uh, at the Amazon side, which also create in an artificial way these spikes. Uh, because obviously, the demand that, that they are faced with, the real consumer demand, it's probably not that's as spiky as what they pass on to their uh, suppliers. Kun, I think you just uh, find out what the bullwhip effect is. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. It is an element of bullwhip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's kind. It's kind of gets emphasized because it's real. It's a real challenge for these uh, CPG manufacturers. So yeah, I can attest. Amazon will pass on the bullwhip effect. It's artificial you can win the box and have an immediate 20, 30% lift in that day in your demand, which is, you know, not sustainable at that mm -hmm. point. So. so I can contest for that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, looking at as far as the, the data that you're currently modeling with, I'm uh, interesting, you know, uh, some questions and curiosity myself on this one. Are you looking at uh, uncertainty is a huge component of inventory optimization, the uncertainty piece and from a demand perspective. Is it the uncertainty in the forecast and the process? Is it the uncertainty in the data that you use? Or I, what is your inputs uh, or the best inputs for creating an inventory optimization model? If I may start on this discussion, and I think this is very interesting. Um, Demand variability or forecast error is definitely driving safety stock, right? The more variable your demand, the less accurate your forecast, the more safety stock. Makes all sense. And I think that understanding better the, the spread of the demand or the spread of forecast error, I'm sure that Stefan will agree here, is tremendously important. So you want to understand this because this is driving safety stock. But on the other end, um, what we realize is that lead times, review period, uh, batch size, but also how you spread your network and you do your multi echelon optimization. This also drives the allocation of cycle stock or whatever you call it across the network. And what I've come to see in many projects is that safety stock, which is mostly driven by the variability of demand, it's not just your total stock. You also get plenty of stock due to cycle time and so on. So, and it all depends from one industry to another, from one project to another, and so on. So I find that once you start an inventory optimization project, it's very important to try to assess like what's the ratio between safety and cycle stock. And then within safety, it's very likely that demand variability is the, the biggest issue. And that goes back to when you educate your, your client on the, what the right stock is. Uh, the, um, you, you, you're able to break it down in those different elements. And uh, so the demand variability is, is a key one. But 
another one that is often uh, overlooked, especially in manufacturing, is the supply viability. Uh, I remember early in my career, uh, I was being slated because my focus was wrong, and my focus wasn't, sorry, Eric, entirely correct. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, when doing some analysis using the tools, I realized that the viability of the production line were driving most of the safety stock we needed. So that gets pressure off my back for a while, not for very long. That, that depends, of course, very much from industry to industry. Uh, but even in a, in a CPG environment, I recently did, did, did a project and we assessed the variability of the output of the lines. And I assumed that in a CPG environment that the output of the lines would be relatively stable, but it was tremendous how much variability we noticed uh, there, that the output in one month doubled the output of another month. So a tremendous amount of variability. And I didn't expect that myself, uh, to be honest, but when you analyze it in depth, it appears to be a, a significant factor. And I have the, and the same experience. Sorry, it's funny enough that variability is often self-created and therefore could be fairly easily controlled. Sorry, Brown. Yep. I, was, I was just going to say to Kun, I have the same experience. We, we also measured like lead times. So what was the time the production order was created and when was it actually then uh, finished? And the, we saw a lot more variability on production lead times compared to distribution uh, lead times. And it might also, I think it, uh, as, as Carl Eric says, yeah, the, the question is how problematic is it and what is self-induced and what is something that you really want to cover in the, like in your safety stock. Uh, I don't, don't have the correct answer to that, but certainly things to think through. Yeah, there's also a big difference, I think, in the type of distribution uh, between uh, supply product and manufactured product, especially in businesses that have production wheels. Uh, where maybe they're on a, a month cycle or a two week cycle, uh, there's actually a uniform distribution across that cycle, depending on what time of the cycle you need your demand. Whereas if you're in a, um, a, a supplier situation, you tend to have more of a long tail uh, distribution. Um, definitely different from a uniform one. And if you approach each as being identical, you're going to get a lot of error in your inventory. Yeah, and, and a lot of course depends on the utilization of your uh, production facility. If, if you're in the upper 90s in terms of utilization, then you can expect that the level of variability will increase in accordingly. Uh, if you have a lot of spare capacity, then you get more stability in terms of lead times as well. You brought up cycle, it makes it an interesting question. Uh, inventory, if you're looking at an inventory optimization model, is it something that you review monthly as part of your SNOP IBP process? Is it more of a quarterly type of, uh, you know, you don't want to create too much noise in inventory, uh, you know, safety stock models and things of that sort. How often are you looking at your inventory models? So there's, um, there's two sides to that. Um, one is how often do you reevaluate the, the model itself and how often do you recalculate the values? And, and my f personal philosophy is that in terms of calculating the values, do it as often as you need to. Um, uh, certainly if you have a dynamic, uh, you know, inventory target, not a static one, um, then you'll actually find that every time you recalculate, you're going to get very minute little changes, but you're going to get many minute little changes. Whereas if you uh, recalculate infrequently, you're going to get a big bump, but you're going to get it very infrequently. And, and in, in my experience, getting um, many small ones tends to be more stable than the, the, the very few large ones, which you know, introduce their own bullwhip to your, to your suppliers. Um, in terms of calculating the model, that's really depending on the business, right? If you're in fashion and you have two collections a, a year, you probably want to reevaluate your model twice a year, maybe four times, no more. Uh, if you're in fast moving consumer goods, that may be more frequent. And if you're in, in electronics and re or introducing new products on a very frequent basis, you might want to recalculate much more often than that. So that, that reevaluation, where does each product fit in the model? Um, that that depends. Yeah. 
Anybody else want to touch that one? The, the only thing I'd like to add is when you do recalculate, just communicate that you've done it. Otherwise, you'll surprise the rest of the supply chain. And if you do that communicate and you do it in batch, it's much easier. Where's that communication happening? Is that a part of your SNOP process? Is there a separate type of form you don't, where is that being communicated? So for me, it's mainly the people who are going to be uh, impacted on the uh, effect of those minute or not so minute changes. Um, so typically your suppliers, if suddenly they see their orders increase by 20%, just tell you, oh, by the way, we've revised this. It's just a boom, not forever. Um, for, for me, the, um, the recalculation should be part of the um, discussion at the supply view of the SNOP process. They should be part of the regular activities that take part in the whole SNOP process. And if there is a problem due to that, um, then it might need to elevate it. The one, one thing I'd, uh, I'd add to what Stefan said is, um, so recalculate, let's say you divide your old inventory in 12, depending, and you, you try to revise some of it twice a year, let's say, something like this. However, when for some reason, there's a disturbance on either product or range of product, maybe just for that range of product, do a review. So um, there could be a, the, 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 the demand variety has changed because the customer uh, uh, behavior has changed on the range of product or whatever, or pollution lines just don't cap out, whatever. If, if it creates a problem, just re rerun it, see what the impact is. And you mean like a pandemic or so? Yeah, I was saying COVID-19, yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Often you review it after a pandemic frequently. <laughs> What, what, what it triggers with uh, me, Eric, is that uh, first of all, I agree with Stefan. I always, I always also said like, I'd rather have some more history in the calculation, but doing more frequent updates than having only three months of history and doing the update twice a year. Because if I have only three months uh, of history and I calculate only twice a year, then like every six months, it's a full reset. So you, you create your own shock. And, and the second thing which I, th I thought was handy is that uh, also put a minimum and a maximum. And um, what I did in the past was also analyze the distribution. So if you look at your fast movers, what's the days of coverage you would have as a safety stock? And it could range, I don't know, between three days to 15 days or to 20 days. And if you look at the number of, of items, it's also like a kind of a distribution. And, and we thought it was fair to, to cut off the tails of the distribution because if something is really very, very stable, I don't know, maybe it's one customer ordering in a very regular pattern. Do you really want to go for a zero safety stock or, or do you want to see that as an outlier? And the same for, for something at the other side, even if it's an A product and um, yeah, for one reason or, the, or another, the calculation is proposing 120 days of safety stock most probably you, you don't want to put it because if you start analyzing the pattern, there might, there might be a tender which has uh, uh, been included in the data. So you might have some, some errors in the input data which, which help you in, um, uh, which are leading to an incorrect result. So putting uh, frequent updates and putting intelligent minimum and maximum makes sense. I've also seen companies who then put the minimum really in the middle of the distribution. Well, that's not smart, right? So you, you need to analyze the distribution before you put the minimum and the maximum. And I can so, um, because what, what I see with many projects is that once you've created your inventory optimization program, and to reply first on this question, those optimization, inventory optimization model are so complex that I wouldn't change the model itself every year for sure. But what I've seen is that inventory optimization is very sensitive to outliers and the input data. As said, Bam, if you only have three months of input, it's very likely you're going to face some outliers or some, you know, different value as Kerlerik and Kuhn said, from time to time you have a client supplier doing a huge order and then your safety stock is going to explode and then you are creating yourself the bull rate effect. So definitely while you do these, uh, frequent reviews and updates, you should really pay a lot of attention into outliers and limits. Otherwise, you might just create fluctuation yourself. Okay. Yeah, and I couldn't agree uh, more uh, with Stefan's uh, remark that uh, you need to update. Uh, the more frequent you update, the, the lower the changes uh, will be. But what we see in practice is very often uh, the opposite. Eh? Uh, 
that parameters are being calculated and then these parameters remain the same for many months until someone all of a sudden notices, well, don't we have too much inventory? Shouldn't we recalculate our parameters? Uh, so there's again a big discrepancy with what we see in practice. Now, I wanted to respond to uh, Bram's uh, comment about, uh, you know, cutting off the tails. Um, if you do a, an inventory optimization, like uh, uh, you're basically uh, not just balancing forward versus backward stock, you're also balancing one item versus another. And uh, in my experience, if there was some major tender that caused the tail of one product to become exceptionally large, that product actually became less interesting to give a high service level in the optimization. And the optimization would drive its service level down a little bit uh, to benefit another one. And that really high tender actually it, it got washed away because uh, in practice, that product did get a high service level because that tender probably wasn't going to reappear in the future. Um, but there's, there seems to be, if you have a true optimization, there seems to be some kind of balancing out uh, and, and some of the extremities and some of the, even the noise in the data can get uh, washed away and, and not really uh, cause a huge um, insensitivity in your model, which is quite opposite then if you're doing like a supply chain optimization, you actually get that these sensitivities explode. But in inventory optimizations, I find they get muted. I don't know if anyone else has that same experience. Well, assuming that there is some kind of service level optimization per SKU, I, I can uh, understand what's happening. It's not, it's uh, because the variability will be high. There's not a lot of use in increasing the service level on that specific item. At the same time, I have, I've, I've not seen any company really using that type of service level optimization. Uh, I was already happy if they had some kind of basic model in place, which was service level driven with some kind of classification. I think that that's at least what I've been able to explain and get companies adopting. Uh, and of course, if, if it's then more based on classification and a kind of a service level per, per, per classification, then, uh, yeah, then you need to put the minimum and the maxima. Or, uh, Ram, it's quite interesting what you mentioned about service level optimization. We didn't discuss about that. And that's one of the things I show in the book that in the end, the, the math that you require to use in order to know what's my optimal service level, to put it differently, what's the perfect amount of safety stock I need to have in order to maximize profitability. And this is what practitioners are, for, are looking for in optimizing profitability. The maths required to do that are extremely simple, and yet I've nearly seen no one using it in reality, which is quite impressive. Okay. Real quick, I think we're almost at the top of the hour, so we only got time for another one, maybe two questions at most. I wanted to make sure I get this one in, because if we're going to look at you know, given the capability of someone to readjust the models, adjust the parameters type situation, is there a role for coding in, in R, Python, uh, that will actually help enable, and, I, and I'll go to you first, Nicholas, since you literally have written a book on this, uh, to be able to help them model using, using those type of programming languages to, for inventory optimization. I think that if you want to, 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 to use inventory optimization full scale for supply chain, you can only use Excel or rely on Excel if the supply chain has one or two or very few projects. As soon as you go above this, you either require to get some black box software, and I'm sure that even within the panelists, we know a few very good tools that do that. On the other hand, what I like to advise is to use your own tool uh, using, for example, Python, but R could, could, could do the trick as well, or other languages, right? Um, what I love about those tools, and this is what I try to show in, in this book about inventory, and this is what I've shown on the book on, on forecasting, is that once you know how to use Python and R and, or any other language, and those are quite easy to master, you can create some kind of very good model yourself. And the advantage of doing that is that you can really tweak them to your own supply chain, to your own problem. And at the same time, you will master them because this will be a transparent box where you really do understand 
the impact of each and every parameter. As we said in the beginning, um, I really find that you cannot force a tool or a model into someone who does not understand it. So at least if you do it yourself, you will really understand all the limitation and what's driving your model. And I think it's great to, you know, with your book, it, it provides, you know, Lori, the foundational principles, but then actually gives you some real codes that you can actually implement and be able to do these things yourself. A supply chain practitioner, uh, a student coming out of university can actually take this and, and start putting some of those practices in, in place. There's libraries out there that help with this as well. Yeah. No, I, I must say, uh, first of all, there's an audience for every approach. Right. And just like I don't understand what's happening under the hood of my car anymore. It's a black box to me. I still I'm more comfortable driving my car today than I was the old clunker when I was in college. Um, and, and there will be people that appreciate the extra slivers of efficiency they can get out of a black mo uh, box model if it doesn't you know, blow up on them. But. Uh, I read your I read the book and I am, you know, uh, a very delighted by the amount of depth and applicability that's provided in it. And I think there's a, a, a every, almost every company will have some power user uh, that's sitting in the, in the inventory optimization area. Um, and there's lots of academics that will if, be future power user, or fu future consultants, I think can benefit tremendously from the improved understanding regardless of you know, uh, a mechanic will drive this you know, same kind of car and they might not understand what's going on under the hood anymore, but they do understand it a lot better than I do. They plug in their computer, tells them what to do. And I think that's the same thing with consultants, with the power users. They need to understand the basic uh, premises. And that I think is the, the, the stepping stone to uh, maturing to, you know, the, for the few companies that, that do for the, the black box models. So we are two minutes after the top of the hour. Uh, we had a great panel, great discussion type situation. Uh, I wish I could have got to everybody's question, but unfortunately, you know, we didn't have three hours to go through it all. And we probably could have definitely. So with that, uh, Nicholas, you did bring us together. You do got a book coming out here soon. Any parting words that you want to uh, provide as far as what's next in inventory optimization or, or, or what, you know, the, new practitioners can be looking to be able to do right now to start optimizing their current inventory? Um, train yourself. As we said, I think you, the model you use can only be as good as your understanding of those models. So the first thing I would advise to anyone student practitioner is train yourself, learn the model and see how you can grab them and get the data to use them. Great. So. I want to thank the panel. I said this was this was an honor for me to, to be able to host this and moderate, you know, such a great panel uh, and talking about inventory. So I want to want to thank the panel and I thank the thank the audience. Uh, some great questions. I apologize couldn't get to them all, but I, I'm sure Nicholas and some others will be able to answer some of these after questions afterwards as well. So thank you, everybody, and we'll talk at you soon in another panel or or, or conference coming up.